far away from our son. And where are you from? Uh, I'm in Boston. Uh, we have a son teaching in Philadelphia. Okay. How did he? How did he get to Philly? Oh gosh, long a circuitous route. He's taught in a series of uh, independent schools uh, in Hawaii, San Francisco, Seattle, and now, and now uh, each about five years. And so now he's teaching at Friends Select. It's a Quaker school downtown. Yeah, right. that's a great reputation. Oh yeah. Huh. Okay. So how can I be helpful? Is there any chance you could turn on your video? I'm, I'm totally. I understand. Oh well, that that that. that would that would help, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I, I I assumed that because I could see you, you could see me. Yeah. <laughs> well, good to finally see you. You too. Uh, I am just curious. That's really the catalyst for this conversation. I run a student support program at St. Joe's Prep down the street from your son. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm always interested in research. Uh, and then just recently, someone gave me the Marshall memo and said, or gave me the, they didn't give me the copy, don't worry. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> they said, hey, you should really look into this. I think you'd like it. Um, and I just started a PhD program. So I'm sort of doing my own parsing through literature of various kinds. Um, Terrific. Where, of, where, where are you doing your doctorate? It's at PECOM, the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine. Oh, really? Okay. Huh. Well. Yeah. So it's a it's a three year program. Um, it's part time, which I appreciated, which feels like a bit of a sprint towards a dissertation. Mm. So I think uh, what what most people would take you know, the first couple of years to ideate, <laughs> I sort of had to just charge um, mm -hmm. straight into the, lit the literature. Wow. I don't know if I ever would have appreciated this as much huh. if I didn't, if I didn't start that adventure at the same time that I saw huh. it. Okay. Um, but I really appreciate just how concise and how consistent you are. So hmm. I figured well, I'd reach out and pick your brain. And I'm sure by the end of the hour, I'm sure I'll learn something. Okay, great. Well, I'm here. I'm at your service. Awesome. Uh, I'm curious, maybe how you would define your academic history or intellectual history. I, mm. I know there's a little blur, blurb, excuse me, on your on your website, but I'm curious to hear from you. Well, academic. I mean, I don't really consider myself a researcher or an academic. I mean, I, I don't have a PhD. Uh, you know, I have a master's degree uh, in school leadership. Uh, so, you know, I, what I have is an intense interest in what works in classrooms, especially from an equity perspective. And I've been kind of reading stuff ever since I was a teacher in the 1970s at a <clears throat> Boston Public School. And uh, then as a central office person, I, I did a lot of reading, had a little more time then. As a principal, I had very little time. <laughs> and I think that's where the idea kind of came from of, you know, wouldn't it be good if somebody were doing a summary of the most important stuff that's out there? Uh, you know, I never had that. I wish I'd had it. And so when I stopped being a principal after 15 years as a principal, I sort of had the time and the idea kind of popped into my head. I tried it out on somebody. I, I was working for New Leaders for New Schools at that point, a, a nonprofit that trains urban principals. And uh, the head of that, John Schnur, said, ah, no, we won't do that. You know, was, I, I was thinking like one a week, maybe, you know, one article a week. And, and, you know, along with birthday wishes to their people in the field. And he didn't buy that. But then I had the idea, well, maybe I can do it on my own. Hmm. So, but back to your question, I'm really not an academic. I uh, never had an interest in, in at the, I remember at the end of my master's program in 8081 at Harvard Ed School, somebody said, well, you really ought to stay on a couple more years and get a doctorate. And I had no interest in that. I really wanted to get back into the field, uh, you know, back into schools. I wanted to be a principal. That was my whole point in going to getting the, uh, the master's degree. So I'm not an academic, uh, but I'm intensely interested in what works, which is partly academics and partly people out in the field coming up with great ideas, which then the academics write up. Sure. Awesome. Um, what did you teach? I taught sixth grade uh, self-contained, which is very unusual. It was a middle school, Martin Luther King Middle School in Boston. And uh, for some reason, well, now I think the reason was that the first year in a very large middle school, you would have a more you know cozy environment with a, with a homeroom teacher most of the day. And then in seventh and eighth grade, it would be you know the typical junior high school kind of arrangement. But it was self-contained sixth grade, so I taught all the, all the subjects. I was there for 11 years. Did you want, you said earlier that you always wanted to be a te you always wanted to be a principal or, or else maybe I misunderstood that you no, went no, got your master's degree to be a principal? Yeah, not always. But <clears throat> so I was at this middle school for 11 years. Toward the end of it, I started reading 
the research on effective urban schools. Mm. So there was a guy at that point named Ron Edmonds, who was at Harvard, who had been in the New York City Public Schools, African-American scholar and activist who really had this belief that there are some schools that do better than others. Let's go in and look at what they're doing you know, with the same population. So I read his research. I remember very clearly re reading the New York Times, uh, the summary of his research. And then um, there's a British book at the same time, a British research book called 15,000 Hours, which is up in my bookshelf here. Uh, which had had the same kind of message of, you know, some schools do much better than others with the same kids. So what are they doing? Going in and analyzing them. And that really intrigued me. And in both, when and those were not the only two doing this kind of research, and both of them, the, the common factor was the principal who was an instructional leader. Mm -hmm. And I thought, ha I'd never thought of being a principal. I was, you know, really committed to being a teacher. I did a lot of, you know, curriculum writing and stuff. I kind of wrote, wrote my own curriculum as a teacher. Um, you know, flying by the seat of my pants, you know, I had some insights, which ended up being, you know, good insights, like ongoing cumulative review. That's you know, one of the insights I had, you know, you can teach the kids something, they take a test, they pass it, but two weeks later, they've forgotten it. So you need some kind of ongoing, you know, tapping the tapping the wheel. So then I went to the ed school uh, to be certified as a principal. <clears throat> and during that year, proposition two and a half passed in Boston. And uh, 27 schools were closed. So there's mm. no way Kim Marshall with no experience is going to be a principal. So, but then I got grabbed by this new superintendent and I was kind of his for, for six years, I was in the central office. Uh, I was his kind of his research person in a way, mm. you know, I was putting him in touch. He was a kind of a, he led with his gut a guy named uh, Bud Spillane, absolutely terrific leader uh, who was not an academic at all. And he relied on me to put him in touch with the research, and I just spent the year at the ed school, where, I, by the way, I studied with Ron Evans, you know, mm. the guru of effective schools. So, you know, I mean, in a sense, that's my academic interest, is the fascination and what works and what doesn't work. Um, and I followed that research, you know, because Ev Evans died very young. He died at the age of 46, just the year after I had studied with him. Um, and so then other people picked up the torch, you know, this type of research, you know, again, just sort of studies about here's a school that's very effective. What are they doing? How does it how is it different from other schools? The latest person is Karen Chenoweth, who uh, I've been touting in the Marshall Memo, her book, Districts That Succeed. It's her fifth book, uh, just <clears throat> saying, you know, here are these districts, uh, here are these schools, here are these principles. You know, what are the specific characteristics of what they do? Fascinating. Sorry, I'm taking notes here. Well, it's no, no problem. Um, that central office work, how, how long did you do that again? I'm curious about that. Six years. Uh, so it, it was not my plan at all. And, and I had the same attitude uh, toward the Boston central office as, as all my colleagues did, which is it's sure. a terrible place. Yeah. Like, you don't want to go there. At that point, it was called Court Street. Uh, now it's in the bowling office. Well, now it's bowling. And in New York City, it's Tweed. You know, people, I don't know what it is in Philadelphia, what, how they refer to the central office. But, you know, it's not a good place. What are you talking and, about? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, they have a lot of power. And, you know, here I was, you know, a young, you know, I mean, at that point, pretty young, um, you know, former teacher who'd been to the, you know, been to Harvard, studied with the right people, with a dynamic superintendent who really liked my stuff. And so I wrote speeches for him. Mm. And then he made me director of curriculum. Uh, so we rewrote the Boston curriculum. So he was there for four years from 81 to 85. And it was a very dynamic time. I mean, we really got a lot done. Um, you know, really had, you know, for the first time, in a long time, there were clear curriculum objectives for each grade level, like a sixth grade teacher really knew specifically. I mean, I was kind of making it up, you know, but they really knew. And tests that went with that to make sure that everyone kind of did it and keep track of student progress. And then Spillane left. He went to uh, Fairfax in Virginia uh, to greener pastures. We gave him a very hard time. And a new guy came in, Laval Wilson, the first African-American superintendent of Boston Public Schools history. And uh, he made me director of planning. So now I had two years as director of planning and that kind of crashed and burned. He got fired. <laughs> so it was sort of a dramatic time. But before he before he left, uh, he made me principal of the Mather School. So that was in 87. And so I finally got to be a principal after, you know, six years in purgatory. Although we, we got a lot done. I mean, we, we did some good stuff. It's, it's really fun working for a dynamic leader who really knows what they're doing and who listens to you. Is, is that, yeah, that sounds great. Is that traditional sort of going to the central office and going back to a school? No, I no, no. Be the opposite. no, no, you're absolutely right. You picked right up on that. And usually someone goes to the school because they, they got fired or they got demoted or, sure. or they were a failure. They got put out to pasture. But I had always wanted to be a principal. It's funny because Spillane used to say, Kim, you can skip that stage. 
you know, like you, you don't need to do that. You can become a superintendent, you can do whatever. And I said, no, 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 no. I know that the principalship is the job. I mean, that's the front lines. And so I was really eager to be a principal. And it, it took some took some doing to get to get that school. I mean, I, you know, I was, you know, I was in the evil central office. I didn't have any leadership experience to speak of. So uh, it was it, it in fact I, I got another job and used that as leverage to uh, you know to to finally get Wilson to make me a principal. The other job, oh, not the not the director of planning. You mean an outside? No, no, no. I, I got a job at the, at the as editor of the Harvard Educational Letter, mm. uh, and uh, you know, which I didn't really want to do. I mean, that was really much more of a research job. I, but I didn't want to do that. I used it as leverage. I I, I don't think I've ever told anyone that, but it's outside my family. <laughs> but that was many years ago. That was like eight eighty seven. Wow, sort of. I'm, I'm interested, having been at those three levels. Do you have a sense? And did you have a sense then where you could uh, enact the most change? Gosh, that's a great question. I mean, in, in, in a classroom, you're you're hopefully doing a good job for, you know, 25 <laughs> kids. In the principalship, I had 600 kids, you know, and I set the climate for the school and I hired and so forth. So that's, you know, certainly a, a much broader impact. Although, of course, the principal is not teaching. The principal is, is orchestrating. Uh, and I think I did a lot there. Uh, there was some really important stuff like, you know, the, the, the movement of kids through the grades, you know, like what happens at each grade level, you know, the overall ethos of the school, the beliefs, you know, the teacher teacher beliefs and so forth. You know, we did a lot there. I mean, I was there for 15 years and, and really worked to the point where I was exhausted. Uh, but I think we did, we made good stuff. You know, we won awards and stuff. And, uh, and then the central office, of course, you know, you have tremendous power, but it's like pushing a string. You know, you, someone in the school has to be at the other end pulling it in. Uh, so we did, you know, for example, it, it was revolutionary in Boston to have clear curriculum objectives through the grades. You know, like we, I still have right up here, I have the, the curriculum objectives that we wrote and they were very specific and clear. They were progressive at that time and and they were the right thing. So that had, so I think I'm going to kind of waffle on that question, <laughs> but most central office people are, are not effective. Uh, but then, you know, for example, appointing the right principal to a school is incredibly important. Uh, in Boston, there's been this, there's certain schools that just go up and down and up and down, depending on who the leader is. Like our, my son-in-law taught it, taught at Orchard Gardens. Uh, it's an elementary school in Boston, K to eight elementary school. When our son-in-law was hired, it was an award-winning school that was so, so incredible that the kids there went to the White House. Like they got some kind of award and the first graders you know, went to the White House when Obama was there. And, and, and then it's like eight years later, the school was like one of the worst in the entire country. It was absolutely, and, and our son-in-law, you know, just had a horrible time. The same kids who had gone to the White House as first graders were in his class as eighth graders. And they, you know, they were traumatized and the school wasn't doing a good job. And, you know, and now they're trying to, now they're a new principal, they're trying to revive it. So the appointment of principals is incredibly important. And then the empowerment of principals, you know, the, the giving them the resources and everything. I think, so that's that's a critical role for the central office, along with clarity and curriculum, you know, sense of mission, sense of urgency, all those things. So the central office places principal. Uh, yeah, right. So I, you think I mean, okay. so often there'll be a screening committee, people will apply and then the, the superintendent will decide among the three finalists, that kind of thing. Uh, but it, you know, a lot of it is attracting the right people. You know, just getting getting the right people. But the principalship is is a very very critical job, unless of course the principal is micromanaged, and disrespected, sure. and and not you know not supported. I mean, situations where, for example, a principal goes to bat to fire a really really abusive and incompetent teacher, but then doesn't get backed up by the central office. I mean, that's you know that's a horror story. Yeah, I mean, to your credit, I think it was a, an impossible question because I'm sort of running it back now thinking people in the central office are probably looking at the school saying, well, as you said, I can sort of push the string, but I need them to receive these ideas. I need to, them to sort of run this play in earnest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But my sense of it, having been in schools is that, you know, we're sort of like, you know, maybe it's the central office or whatever we want to call it. I, I was in a charter school conglomerate for a while. It was oh. called the nest. Oh. Um, and there was this sort of powerlessness, you know, the way that we would talk about the nest was, you know, this sort of almighty, all dictating nest. But I'm mm. sure if you went and worked there, you'd be like, well, it's really this were... symbiosis that 
that is no, that's, that's, to be achieved. Right. Well, that is the that is the thing. What is the symbiosis? So, so uh, in the charter school world, the, the CMOs like Uncommon Schools, Mastery, yeah. you know, KIP, KIP, Success Academies. Some of them really do micromanage. I was a Mastery. Ah, uh, okay, really? Oh, did you know Ryan Scallon? He was, he was a, I think he was a central honcho there. He's now in the Philadelphia schools, but he's a principal that I coached when he was in the, uh, in the Bronx. No, I didn't know him. I was, uh, I was dynamic. one of 24 schools. Yeah. Yeah. So that, so they were, were they in the micromanaging end of the spectrum? Uh, an interesting question. My, my deep concern with my experience of mastery was actually an incentive structure criticism. Huh. Uh, with the principal, or I'm sorry, with the teacher's incentives um, sort of being associated with the benchmarks and then uh, the dean of students sort of being incentivized to limit certain metrics. Huh. So you have teachers teaching the test and sort of just plowing through material. Huh. <laughs> and then you have, you know, um, for lack of really sensitive language, very, very difficult students who have uh deep, deep needs who really need years and years of therapy mm. um, might even need sort of, well, often need what the school can't provide. Right. Uh, and you have the deans are sort of incentivized to not remove them from the classroom mm. for obvious reasons. Right. Um, but the deans aren't necessarily trained psychologists. So mm -hmm. there's this really interesting incentive structure problem where mm -hmm. uh, it seems to me that charter schools are at least mastery was really really good at recruiting uh but not very good at retaining and mm -hmm. the question of retention would have been would have required a really deep analysis of my in my opinion their incentive structures mm. uh, for each I agree. category I, 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 that is a really strong interest of mine and so you know with the marshall memo you know when i'm reading pretty much everything i can get my hands on i've really followed that whole thing of merit pay uh, performance pay incentive structures within schools i'm fascinated with that uh, and I think there's some people who are really doing some very bad stuff with that, because as you mm. point out, I mean, if a dean is the incentive not to suspend a kid or not remove them from the classroom, then the teacher has to deal with that with a kid who they're simply not equipped to deal with, and, or maybe several of them. Uh, if a teacher is teaching to the test, you know, uh, was there merit pay at, at mastery? Yeah. Okay, so that's a disastrous idea. I mean, it's, you know, I follow that very closely. I, I don't know if you've looked in the Marshall Memo archive. But there's a ton of articles about merit, mm. like 46 articles. I just looked it up the other day. So I've really, uh, <laughs> All right. and I, you know, I, I, I'll give you access to the, I, I don't know if, you, now remind me, did you subscribe or, or, or did you? I did. I thought it would be in my interest to try to get oh. you to talk to me if I subscribed. Oh, yeah. And, okay. I, and I knew it would be in my interest to read them. <laughs> so so I, have you looked in the archive yet? Uh, not meaningfully, no. Yeah, probably uh, your your last name is probably your password. So, you know, uh, just your email address. Now there. everyone knows. So if you look under, uh, yeah, yeah. But if you look under, um, um, you know, t I think it's the teacher evaluation colon merit pay okay. uh, in the archive, you'll see, you know, a ton of articles and and the, the virtually all of them are thumbs down. I mean, even in the business world. So, so mm -hmm. the incentives are, you know, incentive structure like that can really be a problem. Uh, you know, because it, it perverts the, the, the quality of teaching, the quality of discipline, the quality of and so forth. On the other hand, mastery is, you know, pretty well regarded. I mean, they've gotten some pretty good results, but you're, you, I think you, you implied that there was a lot of teacher turnover. Uh, a tremendous amount. In fact, I was right before I left, I was on the teacher retention committee, which uh, the irony of that does not escape me. Wow. Uh, and, and so too, the, uh, the chair of that committee left. I was so interested in it. In fact, I... <laughs> I actually seasonally write to them, reminding mm. them of my interest. I would love to sort of write, do some sort of research for them. Mm. Uh, that, I haven't been taken up on that. <laughs> well, you know, Uncommon Schools is is another, you know, CMO. Uh, and I, I've been very close to them for 20 years. I, I coached Paul Bamrick Santoyo when he was a new school leader in Newark at, at the uh, North Star Academy before Uncommon was even conceived, I think. And they tried Merit Pay for a while and they abandoned it. Uh, because they found, you know, for all the usual reasons that merit pay is problematic, you know, that it's very hard to be fair, it creates perverse incentives against, uh, you know, collaboration among teachers, it's, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, for, I mean, well, all the reasons that, you know, that, that are documented in those articles. Uh, so not everybody, and and I, I worked with a school up in Cape Elizabeth, Maine, that had a very aggressive performance pay thing at one point, 
And you know, they abandoned it after a short period of time because again, it just it, it really poisons the culture. So the key thing, as you implied a moment ago, you know, for keeping teachers is professional working conditions. It's it's the ethos of the school, it's the collaboration, it's the support, it's the and it's the it's the um a symbiosis is not quite the right word, but it, but it's the relationship between what you must do. For example, if you're an algebra one teacher, you know, these are the things that the kids need to know and be able to do and understand, but then the freedom to innovate around methods. So the what versus the how to, I think that's the grand bargain that the best schools have struck, you know, yeah. they figured out because, you know, when I was teaching in the seventies, <laughs> that is the 1970s, there was a lot of curriculum freedom. You know, I really was able to do some pretty, what I thought was cool stuff in my classroom, you know, the mm. Bermuda Triangle and Angela Davis, I had all these pictures of all these, you know, African American leaders up on my wall, that wonderful picture of Malcolm X in which it looks like he's saying, <laughs> you, you, know that, <laughs> you know that poster, I was up on my wall, like a picture. yeah, and, uh, you know, and I had a lot of freedom and it was kind of cool, but really part of my mission was to prepare kids to be successful in seventh grade. Mm. And if if my curriculum objectives were different, you know, from from the seventh grade, you know, that that it wasn't very useful. You know, maybe I inspired the kids, maybe I, you know, and I and I'm still in touch with some of my students, my former students, but but you, you gotta have a, a, a logical curriculum sequence. One of the horror stories that I that I tell is that my daughter, uh, Lily Marshall, is a seventh grade teacher in Boston. This year she's on sabbatical, but she's a veteran teacher, you know, like taught for 20 years. And at one point, she was a, a, a high school teacher at Charlestown High School in Boston, and they were reading Elie Wiesel's book, Night, uh, the book about the Holocaust. Yeah, I've taught it. Okay. Uh, so she noticed this boy at the back of the room, and this was a credit recovery course, so you know they had to do well. Uh, and the kid was scowling and looking really upset. So she mm -hmm. went over and said, you know, are you okay? And he said, I'm hearing this for the first time. And the kid, mm -hmm. Like he had never been taught about the Holocaust. So one good thing that's happened in the last 20 years, 30 years, is, is some very smart people have thought through, you know, what should be taught at each grade level, a logical sequence that leads to, to college or, or post, you know, post, post uh, uh, secondary success, whether it's the military or, and by the way, the military, some standards are sometimes better than uh, higher than college, mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know, the Air Force, <laughs> you got to know a lot of stuff to be in the Air Force. So, so that sequence, the Common Core, the Next Generation Science Standards, the C3 Social Studies Standards, I mean, it really has been worked out pretty well, not perfect, but it pretty well like what each grade level should do. So there's a smooth transition from, you know, kindergarten to college and career success. Um, there was a thread in there I want to try to pick out. You, you said something about professional work environments, and, and of course, you balance what I'm about to say with what you just said about curriculum, um, there needs to be this vertical alignment, this sort of sequ sequential logic in preparing students for the next thing, um, <clears throat> which of course starts to get really interestingly philosophical when we talk about what the next thing is. Right. Um, I actually taught Ellie Wiesel in a vocational high school in North Philly run by this group of nuns. It was an incredible little school called Mercy Vocational High School. Now mm. it's a Mercy Career and Technical High School. Uh, it's the only Catholic vocational high school in the country, last I heard. Hmm. Um, but I did my first two years of teaching at um, at that school, and it was fascinating. Sort of, I had to teach I had to teach Shakespeare at some point, uh, and at some point I remember going to the principal and saying, "What if I did some activities where I helped the students, the carpentry students, read through these manuals or read through hmm. these OSHA training thing?" And you know, there was agency there, but I want to go back to that, um, this thread about sort of professional work environments and also some agency to be able to experiment. When I was at Mastery, I was at the one of the top performing Mastery schools. Um, they had consistently the best benchmarks, but they, or some of the best benchmarks, but again, the worst teacher retention. Hmm. They almost, you know, top performing school and least retention it was bizarre mm. um and i remember thinking our best teachers are just sort of of course they're more than this but they're expected to be these automatons and they're mm. not allowed to experiment mm. i would think that of all the people in the building they've sort of earned the right to begin to experiment mm. and it seemed as if the mastery schools 
they couldn't I think they used to call it or we used to joke like they they were really good turnaround schools but they couldn't sort of shift gears to that 2.0 school Mm. where you're not a turnaround school anymore Mm. and hey look at us we have you know now competitive um, scores we are going past that they couldn't sort of shift gears Mm. Um, and and I know that it it would be really cheap to just point to one thing but Mm. I couldn't help but think that that lack of agency had something to do with that. Sure. Oh, absolutely. And and so when I talked about professional working conditions, I forgot to mention one of the best researchers on it is Susan Moore Johnson mm-hmm. at Harvard. And if you look her up in the archive, you'll see a number of pieces. She wrote a book fairly recently. She's I think she just retired. Fabulous thinker about what is it that makes teachers want to stay? You know, the good teachers want to stay. So I don't want to sound like I'm negative about charter schools because some of the best schools I've ever seen are charter schools. And I'm, I'm in favor of good schools, <laughs> like effective schools. And actually, Karen Chenoweth's book, the one I mentioned, I mean, a lot of the schools that she writes about are not charter schools, you know. So uh, I, I am, uh, you know, at the other end of the spectrum from Mastery and Uncommon and KIPP and so forth are the, the so-called mom and pop charter schools. Hmm. And I've been working for years with one in Bedford-Stuyvesant in New York City in Brooklyn. Uh, it's run by a guy named Nick Tishuk. Uh, it is the Bed- Bedford-Stuyvesant New Beginnings Charter School, K-8, to about 700 kids, and they are doing an absolutely terrific job. Uh, you know, I've, I've been there frequently. Uh, they are using my teacher evaluation system, uh, but you know, I've taken it up a notch. And and the the thing, the reason it popped into my head is almost no teachers leave. You know, they really stay. Uh, if you want, I can show you a photograph of their staff, which is which is unbelievable. Um, you know, if you share my, if you want me to share my screen, it's it's uh, it's yeah, a. I love that. And Nick, Nick is just a really, really gifted leader. Um, so, so, you know, and, and he, he is so successful because he has the freedom from a lot of the nonsense of the New York City public schools. He's been able to, to do certain things that he could never have done as a New York City principal. And he's just a, you know, a really brilliant leader. And, and, and people say, you know, they love, they love it. And it's a really diverse staff. Uh, it's a terrific school. So that's, a, that's, that's because of the freedom that the charters have given him. I am hesitating. How, how do I give you the ability to share your screen? So pull down the three little dots in the top right-hand corner, uh, and they, you'll see "Make Co-Host" of my of my photograph. There you go. You'd think a, a year and a half of Zoom class, I would, expert, you know, master. That. I, I was I was talking to uh, to an educator in New York City, and and she uh, she forgot to, you know, unmute her uh, unmute herself, and you know, so the, the most common phrase is you know is is uh, <laughs> is, is you're you're unmuted, and yeah. <laughs> and she uh, uh, she and her comment on it was uh, my first time on Zoom, which, yeah. <laughs> which was pretty funny because you know everybody's been on Zoom. So let's see, I think I've got it here. Shoot, maybe it's under new beginnings. This is the problem when you have, there it is. Okay, uh, no, 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 oh, here, here we go. Yeah, okay, here's here's the new beginnings. Uh, Bedford-Stuyvesant New Beginnings Charter School. Bedford-Stuyvesant, this is like a year ago, this is their staff. And the woman in the front right here is Patience Brown. She's the principal and she is an absolute force of nature. And way in the back here, they're right there. Can you see my cursor? Yes. That's that's Nick. Uh, that's Nick Tushuk. And there's me. I was visiting that day. And the guy in the corner is is a former Marine who is their full time staff recruiter, mm. because you know they're expanding and they they're they're still recruiting people. But look at the diversity and the and these people stay. I mean, they they just love working. You know, almost all of them stay. You know, there's there's you know a certain amount of turnover. That was quite a picture, huh? That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So there is a highly successful charter school. And of course, there are highly successful, um, you know, regular schools. I work with some New York City public schools that are doing a great job. And, um, you know, so so it's I, I, wouldn't, I don't want to paint a broad brush, you know, it's and it's and the key factor, of course, is the principal uh, who then sets the tone, hires people, creates those professional working conditions, you know, motivates people, creates a sense of urgency and all, and all that. I'm going to try to work my way through a, a philosophical question that might uh, come up against a few third rails. <laughs> so grant me some grace if you can. Um, I'm curious in regards to the diversity of a staff, what you think is most important to think about? Is it 
diversity for diversity's sake. Um, well, I, let me even walk that back. I sense this tension between mission alignment for whatever the school's mission might be and this pull, call, whatever we want to say, towards diversity. Um, are they necessarily in tension? Uh, I, I've sort of been in rooms where phenotypically it's extremely diverse, but then sort of ideologically it's everybody's in lockstep and that becomes its own obstacle where, mm-hmm. you know, the, the sort of aberrant thinker is sort of burned at the stake. Um, and yet those, some of those ideas somewhere in there might've been actually what the school needed. Um, mm-hmm. Obviously that's a sort of a narrative, like a cheap narrative form, but mm. I'm curious what you think about when you think about staff diversity. Yeah. So, so you're talking about racial, ethnic diversity in the staff? That seemed to be what you were highlighting in the picture. Did yeah, I, no, it's, was it, I mistaken it, in that? Uh, no, no, no. That, that certainly is one feature of that school, along with a lot of really good teaching. So, uh, so this is uh, something that I'm watching with great interest in the reading I do for the Marshall Memo, is what is the evidence around the impact of having a, of, a, of a student of color having a teacher of color? What's the impact? And there are some pretty suggestive studies that it makes a big difference. I think mm-hmm. Raj Chetty at Harvard has done some research on this. Like, you know, there's a definite effect. Even just having one African-American teacher for an African-American kid, you know, has some impact, uh, positive impact downstream, which is really intriguing. And it's really troubling because of the, of the you know, the, the percentage of teachers who are African-American or who are Hispanic or who are, you know, Latin or who are, uh, you know, American Indian, so forth, you know, where there's a match between the kid and the teacher. And so, and it's going down, by the way, uh, the attrition of, mm-hmm. of teachers of color is, is, is fierce. Uh, and that's partly because of, you know, cultural climate in a school, microaggressions, you know, all the stuff that happens that makes, uh, you know, makes a black teacher perhaps leave a school where he or she is doing well. So that is a huge challenge for American education. So the first step is, of course, is, is being effective as Nick DeShook has, as you saw in that picture, being effective at recruiting and retaining teachers of color. It's really important. Uh, the second thing is right now, most teachers are white women. You know, like 83% or something like that of teachers across the country, including in schools, you know, that are predominantly African American are white women. So, so, you know, that's not going to change rapidly. Hopefully it will change over time, but, you know, because that, because that, you know, the mission that a district has or a charter organization has to really work on this and, and not take excuses and keep working on it and keep working on it. And those white women and white men <laughs> need to be culturally competent. And so that's a lot to do with training and understanding one's position and so forth. And of course, underlying all of this is being an effective teacher. And of course, you can be, you know, an African American teacher and, and not be very good. You can be a white teacher and be spectacular. So, so I think you know it's it's both and. You know, you really need to do a better job of getting more teachers of color, and you really need to do a good job of making white teachers culturally competent, and you really needed to be a good job of working around getting effectiveness, effective teaching practices. The book that I really love is uh, Teach Like a Champion. I I don't know if you're a fan of this. Uh, I I was just talking um, yesterday with with a group in um, Palo Alto. It's actually an independent school in Palo Alto that I'm, I'm doing a workshop for a webinar. And uh, they they really turn thumbs down on on teach like a champion. They just think you know oh you know it's, you know it's too it's too cookie cutter and stuff like that. And and apparently the previous principal had forced it on the staff and everything. But I think have you seen the three edition, the third edition? I don't I don't know which it's at my it's in my office at school. So uh, so I'm this not is, sure which edition I have. Yeah, this is what it looks like. So he has made some significant revisions in this I third edition. No. Uh, he's really, and by the way, he's really spoken up, up on the issue of race and equity, mm-hmm. uh, which which the charter world has been somewhat criticized for, right? Uh, and Doug Lamov is very much of a you know a charter guy, uncommon schools. So the intro to this book, uh, which I summarized part of in the Marshall Memo over the summer, has some really wise and thoughtful stuff about this. But th- this book, you know, is all about effective teaching. Now look at who's on the cover. You know that there are a hundred videos in the book, and this teacher is a high school math teacher, and and he is unbelievable. I actually so, can't see him. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Can you hold it up a little bit? <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay, I see it now. I see it. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so you know, so it's both end. I mean, you know, you want to increase, and and you know, his schools have done an effective job on this, and so has Nick. 
but you got to have uh, you got to have highly skilled teachers, and it really is both an art and a science. You know, but Doug's books, the Teach Like a Champion, and others like it, are really in John Safier's book, The Skillful Teacher. You know, they talk a lot about the specific skills. You know, like uh, you know, this. I mean, this this book has sixty three specific techniques. You know, that that you're probably familiar with them, with some of them. And, and sort of given our earlier conversation, I'm sure this. I'm sure all of our. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of our answers are going to end up being this both end, <laughs> but give, given our earlier um, sort of nod towards agency, how do you balance, hey, you have these 63 skills, um, you know, with this sort of push towards experimentate? I will never forget. I had a, a teacher mentor who was awesome. She ran a reading intervention program at Mastery Charter School, in, uh, the Shoemaker School. She said, Kevin, we don't experiment on children. Huh. And I said, with all due respect, I think that's what we're all doing all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, we're just trying to run a good experiment <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and an ethical experiment and, you know, and make sure that experimentation is um, evolutionary in nature where it's actually evolving. Mm -hmm. um, so I experienced at that charter school, like he, this is the teacher handbook and you're the best teachers in that school as mm -hmm. defined by the the criteria that the school agreed on sort of did all those things um, with some panache, <laughs> mm -hmm. but I definitely, it seemed like there was a failure mode of, of that model that the school wasn't acknowledging. Mm -hmm. And of course I've been in other schools where there's total agency and there there's of course a failure mode there where right, right. you know the, some teachers will thrive with that agency and other they'll yeah. go and read the 3.0 <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. and they'll acquire what they want from that and then they'll apply that um, right. and others will not and the, and yeah. the students sort of suffer i think well, in both failure modes so what mastery you know was showing there and uncommon does this to some degree and i think that the highest level of this uh the, the, where it's taken to the max is the success academy charter schools in new york city uh, mm -hmm. even moscowich's school schools i mean they really believe that they have figured out the right way to do it you know they, they have a formula that has been the, and that has come from the research and has come from successful schools and goes all the way back to ron evans you know very specific things about the way we teach in this school and with a novice teacher that's pretty helpful you know, like Paul Bamrick Santoyo has got a book that's up on my shelf here, Get Better Faster, which is about the first 90 days of a brand new teacher. You know, a very structured series of things that here's what you do in August, here's what you do in September in terms of classroom management, and here's what you're ready to do in October. And so I think that's very helpful. That's where a lot of wisdom and a lot of research can, can accelerate the growth of a new teacher. Uh, but then you get to the point where you have uh, Why? Well, okay, there are two sort of proof points of, of wh where you're going with your question, which is, uh, you know, any middle school or high school teacher that teaches multiple groups of kids a day, but teaches the same lesson, it is it is very common for the same exact lesson to be successful first period, but to bomb second period, right? Sure. And, and so there's, there are too many variables to have a cookie cutter approach, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's, you know, and another proof point is, you know, a group of, te of say, a team of three algebra teachers or, th or sixth grade teachers or whatever, you know, they're teaching a common curriculum, they give a common assessment, they sit down and they look at the results of the assessment, and some kids do better in some classes on certain items or certain things than others. And, and that's where the, the team sitting together, the so-called PLC, professional learning community process of looking together at their results and saying, okay, Kevin, your kids did better at question three than mine. What did you do? Mm. So that's, that's the, and actually Chenna within her book, she says, that's the magical question. When you have a culture where people say, your kids did better than mine, what did you do? Whether it's a teacher to teacher, principal to principal, or superintendent to superintendent, you know, then you have a positive working environment. You have a positive culture. And, and FDR's great question was bold, persistent experimentation. Mm. Like we're always trying new things. Now FDR, you know, president was, was brilliant. He had brilliant people working with him and they had things that didn't work. And so they kept trying new things, you know, until they found, you know, the right formula to pull the United States out of the depression and win, win, win World War II. So it's the same in schools. So I, I think it really is, you know, I think there's some things that are very helpful. For example, you know, most new teachers struggle with classroom management. Did, did you have a tough first year of teaching? Uh, I was teaching at a vocational high school in North Philly. Uh, so I, I, I think considering that I was sort of just thrown into it, I didn't 
I didn't have as bad of a year as I feared and as many people thought I would. <laughs> well, how's so, that for a soft answer? So you, so you may have a lot of baseline talent or, or maybe you had kids who were motivated to listen to you even as a young, you know, inexperienced teacher. Well, I think to your point, I was in this incredible program called the Alliance for Catholic Education mm. at St. Joe's University. It's sort of uh, an affiliate of the Notre Dame, the national mm. organization, Notre Dame. Uh, we all lived together. And so wow. I was with 11 other teachers and we, I, three, I taught, well, two, I taught with at the actual school and then we were all different grade levels. And hmm. so, you know, there was certainly a lot of neuroticism in that house that first uh. year, <laughs> but, you know, and we talked about it constantly and you can, you know, there's debates about balance, et cetera. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but we, you know, we go on retreats. It was a spiritual thing. So we go on retreats and it was very intentional about being an incubator for mm. experimentation and bouncing ideas off. So mm. I, I'm fascinated in that fascinated, even with that title, get better faster in relation to classroom mm -hmm. management and development, because I sort of felt like I was really fortunate to have stumbled into that program where the living situation alone um, mm. seemed to facilitate that growth. Hmm. That's what the uh, Great Oaks charter schools are trying to do is to, is to have the teachers live right in the community you know, right, right close to the action and then to be together to have that kind of, uh, that kind of uh, helping each other out. Yeah, that sounds like good working conditions there. And it, and it probably prevented you from having the horrible first year that I had and that a lot of people have. So, but I think, I think there are certain things that are extremely helpful. I mean, like the thing that, that just lit people up about Doug Lamov's, the first, the first clue of, of Doug's book coming out this years ago, like 15 years ago, the New York Times uh, Magazine had an article in which they highlighted one technique, which was when you're a teacher and you're walking around the room and you're dynamic and everything, when you give directions, stand still mm. and orient yourself directly toward the kids. Now, that's a very simple micro technique. Sure. But, you know, that kind of thing, along with a lot of others, like checking for understanding and so forth, you know, in a meaningful way, you know, those can really help a teacher accelerate their growth. I mean, you know, think of the number of teachers that, you know, that flame out, you know, like 50% of teachers leave within, you know, within the first five years, and it's much more so in, in schools, you know, in high poverty areas. So that's, that's a disaster. And a lot of them could, could have been saved mm. if they had the right direction. And people like Paul Bamrick, Santoyo, and are you familiar with his work? Uh, I, uh, the name doesn't, so he, he, what does he do? So he's the author of, of uh, Get Better Faster. He's oh, written no. five, five books now. So he he was he's the one I met when I was coaching him as a new leader in North Star Academy in Newark in 19, uh, what was it, no, 2003, I guess, or 2004, when he was just getting started as a school leader at the middle school. And then he, you know, rose up, became big in uncommon schools. He's now doing international work, but he's, he's very prolific. He wrote um, Driven by Data. Uh, that's now in the second edition, Leverage Leadership, uh, which is a very widely used book. Uh, get better faster. There's a literacy book uh, for elementary. There's a literacy book for secondary, which I, I can't. Uh, I haven't got the the names in my tip of my tongue. And he just finished a book uh, with Art Whirl on teaching history, teaching high school history. So he's you know, a very prolific guy. Um, and uh, but he but he is somebody who's really caught. Like he's figured out the PLC process. You know, he's figured out like how can you get a team of teachers who teach the same curriculum to give a common assessment and then sit down and have a really honest discussion about what works and what doesn't so we can get better. And that's the sim the simplest version of the PLC, which is a disaster. Most most people are not using it well around the country. It's just, you know, PLC is like a toxic word. Yeah, which is unfortunate because the, the word itself, professional learning community, <laughs> sounds good. Right, well, that's part of the problem is that people, whatever kind of discussion they're having, it's our PLC. You know, like we're talking yeah. about Carol Dweck's book, uh, Mindset. That's our PLC. That's, But that's not the pure PLC. The pure PLC is common assessment. We're sitting and looking at the results, the student mm -hmm. writing, the student project that they that, that all of us taught, and we're figuring out what's working best and how we follow up with the kids who aren't successful. I mean, that's, that's the pure. Have, have you, I'm sure you have, but have you read The Culture Code by Dan Coyle? Uh, oh, yes. One of my favorite books. It is right here. Here it is. <laughs> right at my finger. Yeah, there you go. Fabulous book. I love it. I, I, at some point, at some point, excuse me, I bought maybe two or three of them and I've just been handing them out and then recollecting them, handing them back out. Mm -hmm. um, I can't get my copy back from my dad. I have to, thanks <laughs> for reminding me. <laughs> yeah. But there's a, 
there's certainly a through line throughout the whole um, book about some version of a PLC, but I remember very poign- poignantly the sort of Navy SEAL chapter. Mm-hmm. And I forget what their acronym was after action something, maybe after, a- a- after action reviews, maybe. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And and it's it was so interesting to hear how ruthlessly honest they need to be with each other in order to progress. Like, you know, sort of like the PLC thing, like mm-hmm. what went wrong and, and not sort of, you know, having an ego in the game and being afraid that you're going to be judged off of it or right. your performance or your pay, you know, at a charter school or something might be linked to this thing um yeah. that uh, seems the, to really stifle yeah growth. <clears throat> so on the third hand uh you may <laughs> have seen the report about a month ago in the new york times uh, an expose of the horrible abusive stuff that has happened in the navy seals yeah. <clears throat> i mean people sure. people dying you know unnecessarily in training you know because because they just somebody some people just took it a little bit too far uh, so that's, uh, you know, so, and, you know, there's, there are effective schools that turn out to have, you know, sexual abusers in, the, in their midst, uh, you know, so, I mean, the, the, the vigilance that it takes to be an effective leader to prevent, you know, the basic mission and urgency and wonderful qualities from being perverted into, into something really bad is, you know, that, that's, and, you know, what I advocate with teacher evaluation, and this comes back to an earlier question you asked is, you know, part of part of the agency and the the empowerment of teachers, but at the same time the the guidance and the help of teachers <clears throat> is principals getting into classrooms very frequently, and and really you know having you know short coaching conversations with teachers, but also just being around a lot so that you pick up on you know you pick up on stuff that's just that it's not quite right, and you prevent it. Like for, here, here's a story about that. My wife when she was a um, a sixth grade kid in the Mount Vernon public schools, uh, just north of New York City. Uh, you know, uh, she had a, a social studies teacher, a uh, male social studies teacher, who would bring kids up to his desk to go over their homework, and he would have the girls sit in his lap. Hmm. Now, you know, a principal who was around that school would have would notice that and would have would have dealt with that because that's pretty creepy, right? Sure. And my wife, you know, kept her distance from him, <laughs> but she yeah. remembers it to this day. I mean, we're talking, mm-hmm. like, you know, 55 years later. And, mm-hmm. uh, and and so just being vigilant and preventing the thing from going off the rails um, is, is really part of school leadership. Yeah. Wow. That's heavy. I was thinking back with the, the AAR thing. Of course, you can have a, um, I'm not condemning all the navy seals but of course you could have reports of toxic cultures or subcultures it'd be really interesting though to sort of i i I don't know but my instinct is that i don't know if those are directly related to the aars it still seems like a really useful (laughs) oh no i I wasn't in any way saying that that came from the from the after action reviews you know i I think it it came from somebody who had a sadistic streak or who didn't have the bigger picture. I mean, it's, you know, that that's, that's what, what it has to be. It has to be somebody who says, this isn't right. Hmm. You know, this needs to stop. I think of, you know, Catholic priests, uh, you know, and, and others who, you know, who have sexually abused her. I mean, just somebody had it in their head that that was somehow okay. And people above them thought it was okay or moved them around and so forth. I mean, that whole thing is a huge tragedy to, to Catholicism, which has really strong, good values, you know, and I mean, it's, you know, it goes back to Jesus Christ. I mean, it's, you know, there, there's some decent values there, but somehow at some point through a lack of leadership or through just human frailty, you know, it got off the rails in a very, very major way internationally, right? Totally. I'm, I'm curious, I'm aware of the time and thank you for being so generous so far. Um, yeah. I want to think about how I want to phrase this. I'm really interested in this idea of experimentation. Of course, I'm interested in, in sort of hearing what experiments you're reading about or excited about. Um, but I want to frame it maybe even more specifically. I'm constantly walking around schools, uh, schools I've worked in, thinking uh, this school would really benefit from some cross <laughs> curricular or cross professional um diversity i almost joke sometimes i'm in i'm in a private school now as you know i joke sometimes that we need like three mbas in the building to sort of help with things that teachers traditionally don't have to think a a lot about Mm. um 
or if they do think a lot about it, I find that teachers are often not encouraged to help solve the problems of the school. It's sort of, mm. there's your silo, you know, run the play, mm-hmm. call, call the play, run the play, get back in the huddle. Um, you teach history. That's what you do. Mm. A- and they don't seem to be really involved in the actual decision-making processes of the school or, or the problem solving. It would be really fascinating to think about different experiments of what if a teacher didn't teach five classes and taught three and, and then poured himself or herself into the, I don't know, a community period or a house mm-hmm. uh, model of the school or whatever mm-hmm. their initiative would be. Right. I'm curious if, if uh, in your research, you've come across any experiments that, that seem um, a little aberrant or, or a little risky. <laughs> Well, one thing is is teachers visiting each other's classrooms. Mm. And in the schools where our son, Dave Marshall, has taught, uh, he's really tried, he's like had a, like t- tried to have a club, you know, going around and just, you know, popping into each other's classrooms with, you know, with permission and watching each other. That's, that's one way. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, one thing that I advocate with the Marshall Memo is pick a good article and have the entire staff read it, get into small groups of people who don't usually hang out together, uh, have a protocol discussion and then come back together and talk about it as a whole staff. And I've identified some articles that really work for that. Hmm. Another, another way is for um, for a, a teacher to go through the day as a student, like in a high school or middle school, like to follow a, you know, a specific yeah. Yeah. schedule through the day to get a sense of what it's like to move from math to English to social studies to phys ed to, you know, and, and to, to really experience the school from the student side point of view. That's a very powerful exercise I don't, I don't know if you've ever had a chance to do that it's just uh everyone i, I talk to they say, say it's just it's just life-changing to do that and another thing is something i've done very recently i was out in seattle doing this with a couple of schools out there where the whole staff gets together in grade level teams or subject teams and each team is doing a curriculum unit so i am a wiggins and mctie backwards design guy and i actually work with jay mctie i'm the one day guy so he does the more so he he has me go out for a school that only has one day so i had a whole day with it with his whole faculty so everyone's you know one person is doing greek myths and one person is doing quadratic equations and one person is doing poetry one group so so we walk through the the the, the ubd process you know you start off with the skills then you do the the not basic knowledge, then you do the big ideas, then you do the essential questions, the likely misconceptions, and so forth. So each team does their thing, but then the staff comes together and each team reads their, you know, their their essential questions, for example, and they're critiqued by their by their colleagues. Mm. So everybody gets to hear across the grade levels, like K to eight or through a high school, you know, what are we working on in terms of big ideas and essential questions and projects and performance tasks and so forth. And we get to hear across the grade levels. And that's very powerful when, when you can get that working well, that really does what you're looking for there, which is how do you get outside your silo and see, and it's fascinating to hear a kindergarten teacher commenting on, you know, a fifth grade teacher's, you know, Greek myths thing or, sure. you know, vice versa. People really, you know, when, if you have a safe enough environment, it, it, it gets very, very interesting. And of course, visiting other schools is another thing that, you yeah. know, that can really be helpful, like walking around, you know, doing a learning walk around a different school. Are there are there subjects you think school leaders would normally not brush up against that you think they would be better served to study or to know more about? <laughs> well, if you've read my background, you may have deliberately pitched me a softball here because yeah. when I was a teacher, I got trained as a sex educator. And so we taught a sex ed class to sixth graders at the King School. And then when I was a principal, it was actually required that we teach sex ed with parent permission to fifth graders and no one in the school was trained. And so I did it. Hmm. So I actually, every year, you know, for 12 weeks or 10 weeks, I would teach each of the five fifth grades, you know, walk them through a curriculum that that I developed and which is now being used in different places. So I think it's very important for principals to teach and, but probably not teach something that someone else can teach just as well or better, but to teach something no one else can teach. And then mm. and that, was, that was the case. And I, I'm very passionate about sex ed. I think it, it is extremely important for middle and high school kids to get good comprehensive sex ed that empowers them to make better choices than many of them are making when they learn their sex ed from pornography or social right. media. Uh, I, I guess I'm thinking more from... Um... 
more of a, a school reform, and that's not the, to say anything about your answer, but I, I alluded to maybe people getting an MBA or ah, okay, organizational leadership or organizational psychology or something like that. I, I'm always interested in how how those sort of they're established fields, but that they don't seem to we we as teachers don't seem to have the opportunity to think a lot about them and yet if we did i i wonder sometimes how the school might change hmm. gosh i mean you know the 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 work of being a teacher and being a principal is is extraordinarily over the last two or three years you know the pandemic is extremely uh i mean it really wears you down you know and i i mentioned earlier i got burned out you know as a principal i just couldn't i couldn't do it anymore uh, you know, it's just working 78 hours a week and so forth. And, and I think anything that, that helps to refresh a person, and it could be an organizational psychology course, it could be, you know, going to the University of Virginia and studying with Daniel Willingham was just unbelievably good. It could be a, a mm -hmm. training program like New Leaders. Uh, it could be, you know, just a really good retreat, you know, three-day retreat. Um, I, I know somebody who went to a writing retreat, uh, you know, a week writing retreat where it, it was just transformational. So, but a lot of the stuff, a lot of the graduate work is too academic, you know, is too, uh, one principal I was coaching in New York City went to a, a, a graduate school, which will not be named, sure. and, you know, within two days, literally walked out and got his money back because it was so useless to him as a practicing principal. It just wasn't the right stuff. Hmm. So what you're fishing for is there, you know, and, and I don't think there's, you know, any one right thing and maybe one right thing for one person might not be for another person, but something is really refreshing new ideas provokes challenges them there are you know, psychological safety they can take risks so i mean the year that i went back to the harvard ed school after you know being in the middle school for 11 years the year between that and my central office and principal experience was absolutely terrific i mean i you know ron evans was there carol gilligan was there roland barth was there mm. you know i you know george gothels i mean i i really was stimulated i made a fool of myself in some classes i mean it was really interesting <laughs> Uh, you know, and they uh, really helped me to grow and develop. So everyone needs that. And I mean, the standard thing for a sabbatical is like every seven years, you know, uh, you, you know, you should just completely get out and be away. Hmm. I'm a big fan of summer retreats, uh, you know, like a whole staff going away someplace and doing something really different. A lot of people now are doing a, a DEI, you know, diversity, equity and inclusion work, you know, to try to tune up their sensitivity around race and equity um you know all these things are really important and i think it's a question of the, choosing the right thing at the right time so you don't get burned out so you do continuously improve last question if you don't mind yeah, yeah. i'm fascinated by the book get get better faster i can't wait to pick that up mm. is there a version of that for school leaders i'm curious because we already talked about the importance of school leaders and their development um, well, let, let me see if I can grab the book right now. <laughs> okay, so here, here it is. Uh, get better faster. And I think that's, no, no, it's, it's not fun. Can you see that? Okay. So, yeah. I, but the answer to your question is no, I don't believe there is a book for principals, although there are tons of books for principals. Uh, books about school leadership. I mean, there's a ton of books about that, and I I, I could would have to begin to think about what what I would recommend for that. Uh, but maybe you should get in touch with Paul Bambrick Santoyo and urge him. I mean, in a sense, leverage leadership. His his second book is 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 that. Sure. Uh, you know, it's very specific stuff that uncommon schools are doing. You know, to to up the effectiveness of school leadership. It isn't explicitly about the principalship, but it it sort of is leverage. I mean, the whole thing is. How do you leverage? How do you use leadership to leverage effective teaching and learning? I lied, if that's okay. I have another question. Sure, no, no problem. Uh, how do you encourage teachers? How would you encourage teachers to discern whether or not a leadership role is appropriate for them? Ah, uh, yeah. Well, a lot of people don't want to be principals. Uh, I've, you know. heard, I've heard it said that sometimes those make the best principals. <laughs> Well, yeah. So, how, who encourages them and nudges them, you know, to get yeah. into principalship? I mean, one idea is is a co-principalship. Mm. Uh, John King, uh, you know, you know, you know, was a, a, co a fellow principal of mine in Boston. He he started Roxbury Prep, and he went on to be Secretary of Education under Obama, and is now with Ed Trust. He ran for governor of Maryland, uh, did not win. He's an amazing guy, good friend of of my wife's and mine. 
Uh, and he um, he's a big advocate of co the co-principalship. Like at Roxbury Prep, a small middle school, they always had a principal who focused on curriculum mm -hmm. and a principal who focused on operations. And I've run into that in other places too. So that makes the principalship a little more manageable because to, to do everything, it's just very, very hard. You know, to be tying shoelaces and dealing with kids who throw up and dealing with a, you know, an out of control fifth grader and dealing with a crazy parent and excuse me, an angry parent. Uh, you know, all those things can just consume you as a principal. And I think that was part of why I burned out. Uh, but I think um, we've got to get the right people in. And your question really was, how do you spot them? Because a good teacher is not necessarily a good principal. Well, if I can even direct that further, how do you encourage them to start that? I think I used the word discernment, that process of, you know, self-assessment and analyzing whether or not that's... Um, they're best fitted for that or, or the school would really benefit from them doing that well that's exactly what new leaders for new schools which is now called new leaders has tried to do it's tried to recruit and select the best mm -hmm. people uh to be principals train them effectively with a full year internship and then place them in a school that's appropriate for them and mm -hmm. that's often the trickiest part because there are not many jobs around and so how do you sure. get this person into the right school? And, I, you know, I've coached for new leaders here you know, for years and years, and, and some people just didn't work out. You know, I remember one person in New York City who was so devastated by the process of having to fire a teacher that she went back to the classroom. Mm. She said, you know, I, I don't want to be a principal anymore. Uh, you know, some people have been in schools, there were mismatches, but some people have done fabulously. Some people have done really, really effective work in, in schools and then risen up. And some people in Chicago are at the high levels in the Chicago public schools now. There were new leaders principles so but that is you know and, and a lot of this is making the job manageable providing the support providing the freedom to innovate back to your earlier point uh you know so that you can be both innovative and you know um but we could go on for another hour about that well i'm so thankful for that hour i can't wait to uh get after all the notes you just gave me and mm -hmm. uh, of course to continue to read the marshall memo yeah, well, I've enjoyed I, I, it so far the three issues i've, I've experienced um, I can't thank you enough for spending. <laughs> I think I saw on your website it's like 15 hours one day. No, it's well. So, so the, it's 20 hours each each Monday, Tuesday, uh, Sunday, Monday. You know, it's and, and then, you know, all day Sunday reading, all day Monday writing, and then doing the editing with my wife. And then saying, so it's 20. What what I what I take 20 hours each week to do, you can read in 20 minutes. That's the efficiency. That's but, incredible. Now, have you looked at the the best of memo website? No, you've you've mentioned that I think in one of our correspondences. I have I have not. Yeah, let me let me just quickly show show you what. Oops, no, I'm not at the photo. Oh, I, I took I took it away. <laughs> uh, no, you can look it up, but but it's you know what we did was to take all 18 years of the memo up to that point. Jen, David Lang, and I found the best articles under you know classroom discipline, under time management, under differentiation, under race and equity, and put them into into chapters in a book. And then we we got a grant from a foundation to put it to put it on a website. So all 800 pages are accessible on the website, including recordings. You can listen to a recording of each chapter. Oh, wow. And it's, you know, it's it's just a huge amount. It's completely free. You don't have to be a subscriber. Wow. So that that is our super curated collection in those 22 topics. And we're about to add math where we have a literacy chapter about that math. So I'm working on that today. That's incredible. Well, during those 20 hours, do you just drink protein shakes how are you sustaining yourself <laughs> well look it's it's inside work and no heavy lifting i mean it's it's you know it's i mean i have a comfortable chair you know on sunday i read through <laughs> you know the pie it's right over here i don't touch it until sunday there's the pile like this you know skim or read you know about 150 articles that's it's not hard work but it's you know but it, all my experience is going into which articles are the keepers mm. which aren't and you know most of them are not they're too academic they're too you know, they're too badly written, they're too you know, they're <laughs> action, they're, they're, you know, breaking news, I don't do that. And, but then Monday is the really hard work. I mean, that's just 11 hours of simply sitting and trying to do a good job of taking this 40 page study, and summarizing it in, in clear, non jargony language, and, you know, and getting it so you can read it in five minutes. That's, you know, that's the hard work. And can I ask you what your audience is like? I, I, just can't imagine the world would be worse if more people read this. Well, so so it's it started with 300 people, you know, in, in 2003, you know, just John Schner's people and John Safier's people, they they sort of staked me to the first year. And just by word of mouth, it's grown. And now there are, you know, there are tens of thousands of people. It's, you know, 74 countries and all 50 states, you know, a lot of people just by word of mouth, it's spread. 
So it is, and you know, I, you realize I do get paid for this, right? I mean, you know, it, it is. A, I'm glad you do. It's a subscription thing, and so it's spread very widely, and you know, continues to grow, which is amazing because I'm not really an entrepreneur type person. Uh, it seems that you are now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I, I may not choose to wear I, that. I, I hit a sweet spot. I, I hit a point where. You know, because this is a universal need. I mean, you know, school leaders, teachers, they don't have time to read. Yeah. And so, and now there's a lot of stuff online and that's helpful, Twitter and so forth. But a lot of that is not curated. Mm. You know, like you, you really need somebody, you know, and there are other people who do this, but no one quite like this, you know, who are really looking, okay, what are the articles that really, you know, that a principal or a fifth grade teacher or a instructional coach or a superintendent would really not want to miss? And some of them are very offbeat, you know, like I, I, I look, I don't know, it's not all research. I mean, some of it is just plain good stories. One of my favorite ones is a, a teacher, a third grade teacher in, in the Northwest who, who decided to teach her third graders about income distribution in the United States. And she had them bring in pieces piece of dried macaroni. And they put 100 pieces in, in a baggie. And then they, made, they had like, in the end, they had, I think, 90 baggies of 100 each. <clears throat> and she said, okay, Here's the rug. I'm dividing the rug into five areas, and this is the poorest, and this is the richest part of America. How would you, the students, how would you estimate that the the wealth uh, is distributed among these five levels of wealth in the United States? And so they took a shot at it. It was sort of like this. And then she said, "Okay, stand back, and I'm going to show you how it really is. The poorest out of nine thousand pieces of macaroni." Guess how much uh, proportionally was in the poorest quintile? I, I, it's an unfair question. So the 18. I was going to guess. It, well, in, individual pieces of macaroni, 18 out of 9,000. Oh. And and the, the richest quintile was 72 baggies. So it, it was like, you know, it was like this. Oh. I mean, you know, no, pe most people are not aware of this. So those third graders will never forget you know, this, this lesson now. Yeah. That almost has shades of the, the blue eyed, brown eyed. Yeah, right. Right. Classroom right. Experiment. Yeah. yeah wow. I mean, it's, now we could get into a discussion. Is that appropriate for third grade? So here, totally. here's this teacher is just freelancing. She's just doing her own thing. Talk about experimentation. Right. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, maybe, I mean, we could, you know, I've, I've, I've raised that question with people I've talked to and some people say, well, you know, maybe seventh grade, you know, you know, maybe high school, maybe third grade. It's an interesting question. I, I'm leaning more towards the higher grades, but it is a fascinating activity. Yeah. But then, you know, from the macro curriculum perspective, you want that to be part of a of a K through 12 story, right? Hmm. At what point do you get into the heavy duty questions of, of wealth inequality, especially racial wealth inequality? Uh, you know, when do you introduce the Holocaust? You know, when do you talk about immigration? When do you do calculus? I mean, or do you do calculus? You saw in this week's memo, this very right. provocative article about calculus. I mean, really okay. interesting. Okay, so I got to run. I'm hide that from my students. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I got to run. Uh, really great questions. Uh, very thoughtful, uh, you know, just uh, perspective on these things. Love talking to you. And I hope it's, hope it's helpful. Let me know um, who it goes out to. Yeah, it's been super helpful. I will send it to you first, and then uh, I'll send it from there. Feel free to share it to, to whoever you want. Great. Um, I'll sign off with this. I, I, it's really healthy that you're not impressed with yourself, but but I certainly am, and I'm really thankful for the work that you do, and, and I know that the people that I interact with will be too. Great. Okay, good enough. Thank well, you very much. Thank you so much for the opportunity to, to talk to you. It was great. Thank Take you. Take care, and be well. You too.